Hi, good afternoon. My name is Josh Jackman, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Chemical Engineering at Sungyeonggwan University in South Korea. It's my pleasure uh, to give this talk today, and I'd like to first thank the conference organizers for inviting me to speak at the 2021 Science and Technology uh, Seminar for Cooperation Diplomacy uh, that is being held as part of the Asia Korea Conference this year in Singapore. I'm sorry, due to the COVID-19 uh, you know, travel restrictions, that's a bit difficult to travel there today, but I'd like to thank you very much for allowing me to give this talk uh, virtually. And it's my pleasure to give this talk. Uh, the topic today will be learning about broad spectrum antiviral peptides. Uh, and also it'll cover a journey uh, from my PhD studies in Singapore uh, to my overseas professorship uh, now in South Korea. And I think one of the important things for today's talk, and one of the reasons why I'm so happy to give the talk today, is you know, I'll be talking about research on antiviral peptides um, that we've been doing you know, in my lab and in cooperation with my former PhD advisor and other top experts in the world. Uh, but more importantly, I think for the purpose of today's seminar series, is I'll also be talking a bit about my educational experiences, uh, how I got to where I am today, how important uh, mentorship and, and the educational process was in really guiding my uh, viewpoints on scientific research. And I think that is you know, really what I wanna uh, deliver as kind of the take home messages today, especially for younger students, um, undergraduates, graduate students listening to this lecture today. Hopefully you can learn one or two interesting things that might um, give you some insights in, in thinking about graduate school or research opportunities or other career possibilities. I hope this talk will not be only about this research, but also the broader um, possibilities that the science and technology um, can, how it can shape your life and you know, what are the possibilities for your future. So I just want to begin by giving a little bit brief background about myself, the kind of typical background that you might see sometimes in, in presentations or introductions at a uh, conference or at an interview type of setting. Um, I put this because if you see this alone, it looks a bit linear, but I, I want to actually um, show this first and then go deeper into you know, really who am I, uh, what was my educational experience, um, in Singapore and, and really what motivated me to move to Singapore in the first place. But let me just start with kind of the typical you know, elevator pitch background. Uh, originally, I'm from around the Tampa, Florida area, and I decided to go to the University of Florida for my undergraduate studies. I was very fortunate to be awarded uh, a special scholarship there called the Lombardi Scholarship, uh, which was awarded to uh, six students in, in my year out of about 8,000 students, and it provided a full tuition, a, a stipend, and uh, different types of uh, overseas travel experiences, academic travel experiences uh, every summer uh, during my uh, undergraduate studies. And this was really uh, transformative for me because it, it opened up my eyes. You know, I was able to visit places like Mexico, uh, Greece, Japan as part of my undergraduate studies uh, and participation in the Lombardi Scholarship Program. And this really made me see, you know, the world's a bigger place than what I may have realized when I was doing my you know, high school studies, for example. And I, during my, times, uh, during my time at Florida, I concentrated on uh, earning a chemistry degree. Um, but one thing I was also, another thing I was very fortunate to receive uh, during my undergraduate studies was a Beckman Scholars uh, Fellowship, which is part of the Arnold and Mabel Beckman Foundation, which is a national uh, foundation to support kind of undergraduate research and, and other aspects of research and, and academic life in general. But what this fellowship gave me the opportunity um, to do was actually conduct a lot of research at Stanford University uh, during my undergraduate time. And this really exposed me uh, to cutting edge research and really motivated my uh, future um, Strat uh, my future research strategy in terms of who I want to work with, what type of topics am I passionate about, and really is, was the transformative experience that allowed me to really think beyond just getting my PhD in the US and actually taking, you know, at the time what felt like a risk to actually move to Singapore and, and really change my life and also gave me you know, the best experience possible. So after I uh, completed my undergraduate studies at the University of Florida, 
I actually originally started my PhD at Harvard MIT um, Division of Health Sciences and Technology. Well, the official name of the PhD program is Medical Engineering and Medical Physics PhD program, MEMP. Uh, I started there as an NSF graduate fellow uh, in the bioengineering category. And it was really you know, a great place to see um, in Boston. I, I first year, I took a lot of classes at MIT chemistry department and Harvard Medical School um, in terms of some more clinical oriented classes such as genetics. Um, it was really wonderful. But one thing I felt like in, in Boston, and this was around 2010, 2011, was there's a lot of great research going on here, um, a lot of great stuff, but I kept seeing my eye kind of move towards Asia. I, I had an undergraduate experience um, in Japan, as I mentioned, when I was at University of Florida. I had additionally uh, traveled for a short internship in Korea as well. And really between these experiences in Japan and Korea, I had really seen that you know things like the architecture, the transportation systems, they, they were just nothing like I've seen ever seen in the US. And it just caught my eye because I previously thought in every aspect, maybe the US was the most advanced country I thought. But when I saw how Asia was growing, developing, uh, the population densities, it was so interesting. It was nothing like I've ever seen in, in Florida, for example. And I thought that there's really great potential for the future. And fortunately, uh, my mentor from uh, Stanford University also received a position around this time, a very prestigious position at Nanyang Technological University. Uh, and he was building a new lab to actually um, focus on engineering approaches to stop viruses, so, which was my interest. So I thought between kind of global trends, between my you know, mentors uh, moving to NTU and, and really having a chance for me to be a kind of a foundational member of this group and, and, and see how research groups are built from the ground up to get a lot of kind of hands-on mentoring from my um, advisor, I thought this was really a perfect opportunity uh, for looking at my future. So I actually decided to transfer from uh, Harvard MIT to NTU in 2011. And I um, transferred there and was were fortunate to receive the Nanyang President's Graduate Scholarship. Uh, and I completed my studies, uh, PhD in Material Science Engineering at Nanyang Technological University, uh, which was probably one of the best decisions of my life. Uh, at the time, it looked like a very unique decision to move from Harvard MIT to NTU, uh, but it was really one of the best decisions ever. And I'll go into that a bit more later. Uh, after that, I, I did my postdoc at Stanford University School of Medicine, uh, working on translational aspects of some of this engineering and, and antiviral research. Uh, during this time, I was fortunate to receive uh, American Liver Foundation Fellowship and ACS Nano uh, Junior Fellowship, and also had a lot of great opportunities to do research collaborations with NIH and uh, USAMRID, which is an Army Biomedical Research Institute. And also uh, during this postdoc, I was really um, also exposed to how, how to uh, participate and start building global health collaborations uh, between Asia and the US, which, which is something I'm very passionate about. And it was a really great experience. So this is kind of the you know, short in, you know, elevator pitch style background, but I'll go a bit more into some of the uh, key points of this uh, from an educational perspective. And before I do that, though, I'd, I'd like to also say, you know, okay, I had this education, um, you know, what am I doing with it now? So myself and, and my colleagues, um, as part of a team, you know, we work on thinking about how we can use engineering to stop viruses. Um, this actually looks like a very fancy topic right now. Our work has been uh, featured in, in Nature and in Nature Biotechnology, kind of highlighted as next generation antiviral strategies, the topics we work on. But there's a much bigger picture. You know, if you see my background, you know, you see these kind of fancy articles, you know, it seems like it's kind of a linear story, but, but nothing actually in life is linear. So nowadays our research on engineering to stop viruses, you know, is really regarded as highly promising uh, for, for kind of future uh, antiviral medicine, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but there's much more to it. You know, we began this research at a time when people asked questions like, why would you use engineering to stop viruses? Why, why study viruses? You know, why not use engineering tools uh, to study cancer, which is much more prevalent? 
know, a decade ago, for example, a lot of people asked these kind of questions. Uh, perfectly valid questions, and, and there's no right answer, but it all depends on the viewpoint. But one thing I was really uh, impressed by my mentor, Professor Namjin Cho uh, at NTU, uh, and previously when I met him at Stanford originally, was not to worry about what is the buzz of today, but to kind of see where are the trends, where is the future, uh, what is possible you know, 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later to really look forward to the possibilities. And this is kind of the journey that, you know, I've been fortunate to be a part of. Uh, and I hope that, you know, the kind of attention and, and research impact that we're having today um, is just the beginning uh, to build an even bigger team um, to really truly impact science for the future. And all of that sounds good, but I also wanna go back to a talk I gave in 2013 when I was a PhD student, and, and also to think about these aspects from a bit earlier perspective, you know, how did we get to where we are today um, as, you know, as a student in Singapore, uh, as a you know, future researcher, as a future professor, and, and what was important to actually get to the current stage? So in 2013, there was a group of visiting uh, students from universities uh, in Japan and Korea who um, visited NTU. And, and I gave this talk to these undergraduate students that were visiting uh, as kind of a PhD student uh, explaining some of my choices. And when I was preparing this talk for, for this year, I, I thought that it would be good to begin with some of these um, descriptions, because even though their uh, original talk was given in 2013, almost about eight years ago, um, actually, when I look back at some of the points, they, they've become all the more important now, and I, I became even more convinced of the, the path I've taken, um, the importance of you know, mentorship and, and teamwork, and I, I think it's good to actually revisit these points and to kind of um, think about them before introducing my research. So I'll give a few slides about this previous talk and then go more into kind of our, you know, ongoing research with viruses. But I wanna first start with this choosing the road less traveled by. So you know, this title was inspired by when I was a graduate student at you know, Harvard MIT, um, you know, I had two options. Uh, I could either stay there and earn a PhD from Harvard MIT uh, doing great research. I mean, the, the research group I was in is really uh, fantastic. Um, but I felt at the time, you know, Harvard, uh, Boston, great research, but it's a bit saturated in terms of the environment. It's a great environment. But there's so many people working on, on fantastic things, um, but, but it, it, it's already great. And the other road less traveled by, from my perspective at the time, was moving to Singapore, where around 2010, 2011, it was already developing into a you know, great research um, a great scientific city, but it wasn't quite at the level that you see today. It was still growing up, uh, massive R&D investments, kind of accelerating research culture. Um, but I saw a lot of opportunity for the future. So, you know, I felt like when I made this presentation, you know, there was a fork in the road, kind of stay in Boston or, or move to Singapore. And, and I'll give you a little bit explanation why I did my PhD in Singapore, deciding to transfer, and then how that has influenced, you know, my ongoing research uh, until now. So I wanna first start with kind of two decisions that changed my life and I think really, you know, greatly impacted uh, where I am and, you know, gave me the confidence actually uh, to move to Singapore in the first place. Uh, the first thing was that when I was in high school, um, I really wanted to become a medical doctor. Even when I started at the University of Florida, uh, before starting at the University of Florida, um, I was really passionate about um, you know, wanting to become a doctor. Um, there's just a brief newspaper article when I received a scholarship to go to Florida, um, you know, mentioning my passion for you know, history and biochemistry and plan to attend medical school after completing my undergraduate studies. Um, you know, I'm still, passionate about history. I'm still passionate about biochemistry. I studied them. I took classes in them. I really enjoyed them. Um, but the interesting thing was even day one of my undergraduate um, classes, I actually made the decision not to attend medical school. And, and the reason that was because I was because I took a very interesting uh, 
introductory chemistry class, an honors level chemistry class, uh, with just a very small environment, about 30 students. Whereas normally undergraduate, like an introductory chemistry class at a school like UF size, would maybe have a couple hundred students. But this was a very special class. And I was very uh, impressed by uh, the instructor of the class, Professor Randy Duran, who, who's now at NSF, uh, leading a lot of material science education research initiatives. But at the time, he challenged us um, you know, to really think about you know, undergraduate research, uh, getting involved, uh, why research was so impactful for innovation, uh, creating new things. And the, these points that he raised in the class were, were so impressive to me. Uh, and I had never thinking about research before. Before I came to undergraduate, uh, frankly speaking, I thought you know, research was a bit boring. I involved you know, tedious lab work. Um, I, I never really thought about the bigger picture. Why do we do the lab work? Why, why, why are we asking these questions? And he really opened my mind on day one. Uh, I went to his office right after class. I told him, you know, uh, how can I participate? And, and from there, you know, I, I've been um, immersed in research my whole life. And it, it's really, uh, you know, I never imagined before that day that I would decide not to become a medical doctor, which is an extremely noble profession, a wonderful profession too. Uh, but somehow I got caught up in, in the research and in the possibilities of creating something new uh, beyond um, current practices, which you can also do as a doctor. Uh, but just for my own case, I found that you know the PhD experience, um, a fully focused research experience, was really um, the best opportunity for me uh, to achieve, you know, this, uh, to build on this curiosity. The second thing that I did, um, kind of decision that I think really changed my life was actually making the decision to transfer uh, from Harvard MIT to, to NTU. So this Harvard MIT Health Sciences Technology Program uh, that I was um, part of was just, you know, a fantastic group of people, uh, really very prestigious PhD program. Uh, you know, you see statistically, I roughly estimated the statistics uh, based on what was uh, explained to me. And approximately 29% of the students entering this PhD program were honors graduates from MIT, 12% were honors graduates from Harvard, 18% uh, were university valedictorians, 18% uh, were international students with government scholarships, 100% received competitive external funding. Uh, so this is a very elite group of you know, PhD students. And you know, I was very blessed to actually be part of this group. Um, first year I received a you know, scholarship, Martino Scholars Award for a you know, good first year performance. Um, so, so it was really a great academic experience. You know, if you have a Harvard MIT PhD degree, of course it's a great thing. Um, but in my own personal case, I, I thought Harvard MIT is great, but it, it, deep down in, in, in my heart and you know, my pat, scientific passion, um, I, it wasn't exactly what I wanted. You know, when I saw the opportunity to move to NTU and my advisor from Stanford moved there, uh, I thought this was really the next frontier, kind of the wild, wild west of 21st century science. And I, I just kind of seized the opportunity um, because I thought, well, if you don't do it now, you're not, you're never going to do it in your life. Uh, you know, you only live once. Take the chance. What do you have to lose? And and this was really a wonderful experience for me. Now, in terms of you know, how did I make those kind of daring decisions? Why was I so uh, impressed uh, by my PhD advisor? Um, and, and why was I so impressed by my mentoring, uh, by his mentoring experience of me uh, at Stanford? You know, what gave me that kind of confidence uh, to actually make those kind of decisions? I want to talk a little bit about my undergraduate research experience at Stanford, um, how I actually uh, ended up at Stanford, uh, how I, you know, learned what real research means, where things don't always work perfectly the first time. Um, how that kind of led to a really strong relationship with my uh, future advisor and you know what it taught me uh, about research life and what's kind of you know continued to grow in me over the last 10 years um, from in terms of my philosophy so reu is kind of a research experience uh, for undergraduates it's it's typically refers to nsf educational programs or summer undergraduate research 
Um, Stanford has one, and I was very uh, fortunate to participate in it. So I want to talk a little bit about my REU experience uh, in the summer of 2008, I believe it was, and, and kind of talk about how all of this materialized. So before going to Stanford, I had won a national fellowship, the Beckman Scholars uh, Program Fellowship, uh, to pursue undergraduate research. And as part of this fellowship, I selected um, attending Stanford University uh, because of my future advisor's work, uh, Professor Namjin Cho, uh, who at the time was the Dr. Namjin Cho at the uh, Stanford University um, Medical School. And I was really impressed by um, Professor Cho's work, even at this early stage, because it was so unique. It was really, really nothing like I'd ever seen in the field. So he had shown how to actually use peptides to interact with membranes, lipid membranes, and in very unique ways. And unequivocally, this was the best research in the field I had seen. I had read hundreds of papers, and I, I had just never seen anything like it. it a lot of the papers in, the, in this kind of lipid membrane biotechnology field that I was working on, um, they were interesting, but they were very fundamental in scope. Um, understanding basic physical chemical properties, um, which, which is good. You know, my group and, and Professor Cho's group still studies those aspects. Uh, but, but what Professor Cho's work at the time uh, really opened up in the mind, uh, opened up in my mind was the uh, possibility to think bigger, to think bigger than uh, fundamental characterization, to think about how fundamental characterization can be connected with applications. And I, in my own personal opinion, I consider this the best work in the field. And I thought, well, I'm young. I don't know anything about science research, you know, really practically speaking. I should learn from the best. Now, this is really what motivated me to go to Stanford and work with Professor Cho and, and his uh, also his PhD mentor, uh, Professor Curtis Frank. So I, I uh, had selected and kind of um, sent some emails and so forth and, and got the opportunity to work in Professor uh, Curtis Frank's group. Um, and really, you know, this decision was really motivated uh, by wanting to work with Professor Cho. I wanted to meet this guy. I wanted to know how he created these kind of projects, what went through his mind, and to learn from him. And I also thought at the time, you know, I was still kind of not fully sure whether PhD or MD PhD uh, at early stage in my undergraduate career. I knew I wanted to do a PhD, but I wasn't quite sure whether to do MD PhD or PhD. Uh, so I thought, you know, this kind of experience, you know, I was a bit naive and also thought, you know, hey, it's a good addition to my resume. So why not do this kind of experience? Now, when I showed up to Stanford um, over the summer, uh, it was, it was a uh, very interesting first six weeks there. Uh, I was used, I, mean, I, had, I had this fantasy in my brain, like, uh, oh, I'll go there, I'll work with Professor Namjin Cho, and, you know, I'll, I'll learn great stuff, and, you know, it, it'll be automatic, you know, so easy, so, so great. I can just work with him and teach me everything. But in research, like in pretty much anything in life, nothing works, you know, uh, so easily. So the first meeting I had with um, uh, Professor Curtis Frank, my main supervisor at Stanford, you know, he suggested that lipase, a type of uh, enzyme that uh, catalyzes the breakdown of phospholipids, uh, would be interesting. So Professor Frank suggested to me that lipase would be an interesting topic. Uh, the first challenge that I encountered was no uh, encountered at the time was that no one in the group uh, studied lipase. So here I was, this kind of fresh, naive undergraduate. And Professor Frank suggested a very interesting topic, um, but a topic that no one studied yet in the lab. Um, in hindsight, uh, this was the you know best suggestion possible, but in practicality at the time, you know I was wondering you know who can I lean on? No one knows the topic. I need to learn it, uh, which is quite a bit daunting for for a young undergraduate. Uh, a great thing, but also a challenging thing. Uh, second thing, so I really wanted to work with him. You know, Dr. Namjin Cho at the time of postdoc. Um, but challenge number two, <laughs> Professor Frank said Dr. Cho was too busy to mentor me. Uh, he had just finished his PhD and was now at the medical school uh, next door. Um, so he said, you know, let's find another mentor. Uh, so I was a bit disappointed because I really wanted to work with Dr. Cho. Um, but he said, you know, let, let's 
just you know hold off. You know, we have a lot of other great people to work with. Um, so you know, I really, really wanted to work with them. Um, there are many other great people at Stanford, but I was a bit disappointed because you know I really read every one of Professor Cho's papers uh, until then and kind of tried to memorize them as best as, best as possible. So kind of um, I guess you could say idolized him in terms of the research. Um, so I, I definitely was a bit frustrated, but that that's life. I mean, per, you know, it, it's a perfectly reasonable. Um, uh, situation, you know, Professor Cho should be busy, um, but I still really wanted to work with him. So there was a bit of uh, frustration there. And the third thing, uh, which any graduate student uh, towards the end of their graduate school time will fully understand, um, the PhD mentor um, that Professor Frank assigned to me uh, was busy finishing his PhD. <laughs> Again, a perfectly reasonable thing. Now, this was you know, reasonable, but from my perspective of having a mentor during my undergraduate research internship, uh, it was also it create, made it a bit challenging because I had to really figure things out on my own. Uh, basic lab skills, experimental design, you know, I, I was more or less on my own during these first six weeks there. So the kind of combination of these factors, you know, no one in the group studied lipase, um, Dr. Cho was too busy to mentor me, and I really had to figure things out on my own. Uh, it created, you know, a lot of learning, but also, you know, somewhat some frustration. So during this time, after a few weeks of really, um, you know, challenging environment to move forward in, I, I grew a bit frustrated and, 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 you know, disappointed in this situation. So I, I also decided on the weekends a little bit you know, to travel the Pacific Coast Highway, um, to, to visit, you know, San Francisco. And, and I had a great experience in Stanford, met many great people. Um, but during these first six weeks, uh, to be honest, you know, there was just a little science and then scarce results. Uh, so in one sense, you know, I saw many beautiful things and you know, I was it's very happy uh, to see California for the first time. But but something inside was, was kind of missing. I, I, I just, you know, I realized that why I could maybe get like an A plus in a class by studying by myself, uh, research doesn't work that way. Even I do it by myself, I, I can't really, uh, you know, succeed by myself. It doesn't mean that I'm not a good researcher. It means that research doesn't happen by individual people. Uh, research happens by teams. And, and it was a very important lesson. So at the time I was a bit disappointed in the kind of science in terms of I wanted to publish a lot of data very quickly and, and solve all the problems in one day, but science doesn't work that way. And this first six weeks um, was one of the best experiences of my life. At, at the time it was extremely frustrating um, because you know the science wasn't turning out as I expected. Uh, even though I saw many beautiful places in California, um, it wasn't really what I wanted. You know, it's, it's just kind of a diversion to avoid the challenges in the lab in, in some sense. Um, but it was also the time that I really realized um, for probably the first time in my life, you know, just how important uh, the team is. So after these first uh, six weeks, you know, I bumped into uh, Professor Namjin Cho uh, a few times when he visited um, Professor Frank's lab, or, um, uh, you know, I, I'd seen him in various contexts. And I noticed, you know, over time, you know, Professor Cho started paying more attention to me, even, even though he wasn't assigned to me, you know, he wasn't like, uh, he wasn't responsible for me. Now, over time, he kind of recognized my interest in science. And, and over time, I talked to him more, uh, he gave me some opportunities to start kind of reading some of his manuscript drafts, giving feedback on them. And I felt like this was kind of a second chance to connect with Professor Cho. You know, over time, he, he, he saw that I really want to do good research, um, you know, realized I was a young undergraduate. And, and over time, he actually really adjusted his very busy schedule uh, to make time for me to actually help me become a good scientist. And, and this started by actually helping me design a research project based on my pace. Because the, during the first six weeks, you know, I had read you know hundred papers on my pace, but I didn't know actually uh, what to do with that information. You know, information by itself is just information. How do we critically synthesize information into generating new ideas and and, and analysis? 
And he helped me actually design a research project based on the information that I had learned. Uh, he also very generously taught me lab skills and, and helped me do experiments um, to you know, test the hypothesis um, that we developed for the lipase study. And he really kind of instilled in me that nothing happens automatically. If you want it to happen, you need to work very hard. And in, I had worked hard in undergraduate, you know, in ACT classes, but this was a new type of working hard. I, I really saw the hard work with the right direction really trans, uh, increases the chance for research success. And during this next few uh, months, when I worked with Professor Cho very uh, intensively at Stanford, um, you know, it typically consists of 18 to 20 hour days, uh, seven days a week. And we were really uh, very, very, uh, you know, had some very great results for the lipase studies. And this led me to publish a first author paper in a top journal, um, which was really critical to my graduate school um, admission success. Um, you know, Professor Frank uh, kind of verbally um, wanted to get me uh, to, if, if I wanted to apply for the PhD program at Stanford, uh, you know, chemical engineering, um, you know, he'd more be willing to, um, you know, support me in his lab. And I was very, very honored um, by those possibilities. Uh, it also created, you know, a lot of other um, admission successes, you know, in terms of getting into programs such as Harvard, MIT. You know, I think, you know, coming from University of Florida, uh, it's really not easy to, to get into our Harvard, MIT for a PhD program. But I think this experience with uh, Professor Cho mentoring me at Stanford uh, was really critical uh, in terms of kind of objective criteria, such as publishing a first author paper in a very good journal, um, but also mentally in terms of kind of being prepared for these new uh, challenges, you know, understanding what hard work really means, um, not, not only working hard for the sake of running around, you know, like, like a headless chicken, but, but actually hard work you know, towards a structured goal, towards a very clear objective. Um, so, so I was, uh, very fortunate for this experience, and it really, you know, meant a lot to me. Now, at the time, you know, uh, with 2013, this was about two, uh, four or five years after this original undergraduate experience, when, when I originally gave this talk in 2013, um, I tried to actually, you know, think about what this undergraduate research experience had meant to me. Um, and, and I had written a few of these points, and, and now when I look back to them, I, I, I think these were, you know, I have the same thinking, um, and, and it, it, I'm become ever more convinced in these points. Um, but what I really want to emphasize um, talking today is, you know, science is more than science. You know, science is not a set of facts or, or descriptions of physical chemical phenomena. Uh, science can solve important problems in life whether it's related to healthcare, energy, sustainability, uh, small problems, big problems, science is a platform to solve important problems in life. The concepts of engineering is an approach. You know, when we engineer a system, we want to understand how different parameters uh, may affect the performance, how we can control those parameters and actually build something, whether it's a you know, device or whether it's a new drug, um, pharmaceutical drug, uh, build something that can really Im Im allow us to uh, improve a biological system or Im improve the performance of something uh, in a tangible way. Now, when, when thinking about this, you know, fundamental characterization is typically a very important part of engineering. But, but one thing I learned from working with Professor Cho is characterization is extremely important. Uh, it is definitely the starting point. However, it is not the final goal in many cases. Uh, for really translational research, for impactful research, we, we can think about uh, how we understand the system first. And, and by understanding the fundamentals of a system, uh, we can kind of understand how to tailor it or how to uh, utilize those capabilities uh, to solve real problems. And, and this is also you know, really um, paramount when we think about medical problems, because uh, many medical problems on the surface, uh, they cannot be solved using conventional approaches. Uh, if they could be solved using conventional approaches, they would have already been solved. Uh, but what I learned from working with Professor Cho is you know, how we need uh, new approaches to actually uh, see things in a new light. Uh, how can we think of 
medical problems from a chemical perspective or engineering perspective or physics perspective and, and how we need to work with people from different backgrounds, medical doctors, scientists, engineers, businessmen, uh, business people, uh, government officials. We need to make a team of people from different diverse backgrounds uh, to really understand you know, how we can solve the problem, not only in the lab, but to translate those results uh, to the real world. And when we think about especially healthcare problems, uh, thinking from a clinical perspective is very important, but you know, so is fundamental biomedical research. Uh, we need to find new solutions to problems. And this doesn't occur um, just by looking at the end goal, but really having this deep fundamental understanding of how systems work. Um, if we modulate a system by, for example, changing a parameter such as temperature or the concentration of some molecule, what happens? And, and how can we utilize this information in, in meaningful ways? So you know, my, one of my advice that I, I take home uh, from, from these experiences and, and from my subsequent experiences is a few things that really stood out to me as really important for building my scientific career uh, included you know, networking, you know, finding the best people in your field or finding the right people in your field, um, you know, people that are um, you know, really working on great stuff and, and you know, uh, great individuals as well. Uh, networking with these individuals and, and, and really building team over time. That doesn't mean that the people you meet today uh, may directly you know, help you immediately. Uh, you, know, you should not be so calculating, uh, but um, building network with sincere people who are committed, uh, it'll pay off in various ways over time. You, you cannot predict how those people will help you, when they will help you, or, or if they will even help you. Um, but in general, my suggestion is always network with sincere uh, people that have strong passion uh, for what they're doing. And, and over time, uh, your network will grow and it, it will you will benefit that network and that network will benefit you in unimaginable ways. Uh, the second point uh, that I want to uh, emphasize is also uh, loyalty. So you did not get to where you are or no one in the world got to where they are uh, based on their uh, individual effort alone uh, exclusively. There was a set of people um, some that you may recognize, some that you may never have met, even or that you, you can even think of, um, that helped you get to where you are today. Uh, this could be your mentors, this could be your teachers, your family, um, but really recognizing where you come from uh, and, and really um, you know, staying committed to helping them through good times and bad times uh, is, is very important. You know, life is not just about research accomplishments or how many papers you published, but it's about the people around you. And it's very important to, to remember those people around you. So when you become laser focused on certain research topics, uh, it's easy to kind of forget uh, the people. It, it's, it seems like an easy thing I'll never forget, but it happens. We're human beings, we always look forward. But as we look forward, we must always look back and remember who helped us um, and to appreciate that and to really support them um, in, in various ways as you move forward as well. And that loyalty is a two-way street uh, and it really um, helps you sustain you know, through research ups and downs because, because research is not always going forward. Uh, research is not always leading to nature publications, um, but when you have a good time, when you have a bad time, just make sure you remember you know, who are your team members um, who got you to where you are today and to always you know, think, how can I help the people in my network? Next suggestion that I have is you know, focus. Uh, there's so many interesting scientific topics. Uh, some look fancy today, some don't look so fancy, uh, but everything is, has the potential for great science, uh, even if it's not on the nature you know, cover. And I think more important is to find a topic you're passionate about and to really become the expert in it, to really study every nook and cranny of the topic, to really understand how the system is working um, and to really think about it deeply and really understand it. A great example is engineering approaches, uh, lipid membrane engineering for studying viruses. Uh, when we started it, you know, Professor Cho or uh, and Professor uh, Frank and Professor Jeffrey Glenn at Stanford started it maybe in around 2003, 2000, 
yeah, around 2003. And I, I uh, became part of the team from around 2008. Uh, but in these early days, uh, not many people studied uh, viruses using engineering approaches, especially with lipid membranes. Uh, and many people would ask, oh, why are you doing this? What's the significance? Um, even though you can explain it and justify it, people still wonder, oh, this seems a bit you know, niche or you know, a little bit esoteric maybe. Uh, okay, interesting, but you know, it'd be good to study the, you know, cancer instead, why not? But if you see now, you know, 10, almost 10 plus years later, um, lipid membranes and engineering studies for viruses um, is extremely hot topic. And, and I think this really emphasizes that we, we cannot predict the future. Uh, we don't need to predict the future solely. We, we can think about what is interesting topic, um, what, what, what is important. Uh, and, and if we have some topic we feel compelled to study that we think is important, and we have a clear reason why we think it's important, I think it's very important to enjoy studying that topic. It could be a fundamental topic, it could be an applied topic, but make sure that you really delve into it and, and put your passion and, and the results come out, you know, whether it's, you know, going to be, uh, you know, become, stay a specialist topic or whether it becomes, you know, one of the most popular general audience topics, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. I think more important is, are you contributing to that field or the results you're, um, or the results you're generating uh, advancing the field. And you know, hopefully eventually if you do that, uh, things naturally work themselves out and, and over time uh, innovation comes. But it really starts with a laser focus. If, if you're doing 10 topics and you're devoting 10% to each, uh, it's very hard to make a very impactful result, whether fundamentally or from an application perspective. But if you really put laser focus and really become the best in the topic, uh, it's very, very uh, easy over time, eventually, uh, to make a meaningful contribution. And this really ties into the last uh, piece of advice that I'd like to give, uh, which is determination. You must stay committed to the cause. There will be ups and downs, but over time, you must stay committed uh, to what you care about. And you know, on the left here, I, I show this kind of um, idealized uh, plot of success versus effort where we think there's a linear correlation, uh, more effort, more success, but the world doesn't work that way. On the right, we see a bit more um, realistic one, uh, you know, success, effort, um, a bit more incrementally, you, you kind of stepwise function. You, you can never imagine, you know, when you put effort, uh, you know, what would be the result? I mean, it, it doesn't work that way, uh, but over time, if you demonstrate sincere effort, um, plus you rest and you know stay healthy, but you continually put sincere effort with focus, over time the success will come. Uh, some days you know you may feel like you went up a step. <laughs> some days you might feel like you went down two steps. Um, so so there's always ups and downs. Uh, but over time, uh, things will work themselves out in, in various ways that we could never have predicted from the beginning. So now, you know, based on those experiences I had and kind of, you know, help me get to where I am today, I, I really want to now uh, switch gears uh, to a bit more um, fundamental kind of scientific presentation to kind of show more of the scientific trajectory. So, you know, so far I've kind of introduced uh, the kind of personal educational trajectory of, you know, my research career uh, from my PhD um, to overseas professorship, but, but now I really want to go on. Uh, shift perspectives to more of a research perspective. Uh, so you can also see how uh, research evolves over time and you know, how this kind of coincides uh, with kind of you know, the personal journey. Uh, so originally when I was at the University of Florida and, and also um, during my time at Stanford University um, during my undergraduate studies, I was very interested in kind of fundamental biomembrane science. I uh, meaning I was I was interested in how lipid membranes, uh, which are kind of the important coding of, of uh, cell membrane surfaces, uh, how lipid membranes uh, can be useful for various applications, you know, related to kind of biosensors um, in, in various types of uh, sensing platforms. So my original bio my original biomembrane science research 
focused on you know, how we can actually fabricate uh, lipid bilayers on surfaces such as silicon oxide, uh, titanium oxide, how we can make um, kind of platforms con consisting of uh, liposomes or uh, spherical lipid bilayers or uh, lipid nanoparticles on surfaces. And, and how, what are the kind of fundamental um, interactions um, involved in lipid substrate interactions uh, in terms of like lipid oxide interactions? You know, what is the, and how does electrostatic force affect these interactions? How does van der Waals force affect these interactions? Uh, how does hydration force uh, affect these interactions? And this research felt very fundamental at the time, uh, but actually it really provided a platform to think kind of critically about uh, different types of um, you know, uh, interfacial phenomena and really gave a platform to actually think about biology in, in later stages. Uh, so during this early part of my research, uh, I really got a you know, strong foundation in understanding the kind of fundamental self-assembly and colloidal properties of, of lipid nanostructures, uh, but also I was exposed to many different types of interesting surface sensitive measurement techniques, uh, acoustic, optical, biosensors, for example, uh, and really understood you know, how can I um, combine uh, lipid systems with uh, different types of biosensing strategies to, to learn about um, interesting phenomena. And this, this led me to also uh, study a lot about nanoplasmonic sensors. Um, so for certain types of kind of metal nanoparticles, uh, when they interact with light with certain wavelength, um, you can create a coherent oscillation of electrons near the surface of these metal uh, nanoparticles. And this creates an enhanced electromagnetic field, uh, which is actually really useful for biosensing applications because when a, a material like a protein molecule or a lipid molecule uh, actually interacts uh, with the metal nanoparticle, uh, actually it distorts this electromagnetic field a bit. Uh, and we can measure this um, using spectroscopy techniques. Uh, and it's a really interesting technique to study kind of uh, biomacromolecule absorption, uh, conformational changes. Uh, so I was really interested in, in from doing this early biomembrane science uh, to actually exploring kind of new techniques to study biomembranes, uh, which led me to study uh, localized surface plasma resonance, LSPR, and extraordinary optical transmission, EOT. Um, so it was really interesting to actually begin evolving uh, from kind of a more pure biomembrane lipid focus uh, to actually beginning to think about you know, how can we utilize uh, new techniques uh, to actually study lipid related processes uh, in, you know, in, in greater depth. And based on these interesting biosensor techniques uh, and, and interesting kind of lipid membrane systems and in building on what Professor Damjan Cho had um, previously done, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I talked with him a lot about how we can kind of really start pushing the envelope uh, pushing, pushing the field uh, from fundamental uh, peptide, membrane peptide interactions um, towards thinking about using these technologies in a bit more applied context to understand what is the fundamental mechanism of how antiviral peptides work, uh, how can we utilize that information uh, to actually start thinking translationally about how we can develop really interesting uh, systems for you know, developing new antiviral medicines, for example. So when we started thinking about this, you know, we were really interested because uh, many medically important viruses are, have a lipid membrane coating that looks like a lipid bilayer. Uh, it's called the virus envelope. Uh, and this envelope is really, really important uh, for the virus infectivity. If this envelope is damaged or broken, uh, the virus will likely lose its infectivity and no longer uh, be dangerous. So we were interested in seeing how uh, lipid bilayers and lipid membranes can be models uh, to actually uh, mimic this virus envelope and how we can study um, the interactions of antiviral peptides uh, with these membranes uh, in order to begin to understand the mechanism of action and, and also to build kind of biophysical models understanding how antiviral peptides work. Um, because before all of this work, there, there was a lot of work on antimicrobial peptides that, that mainly uh, inhibit bacteria. And in such cases, um, for example, uh, antimicrobial peptides are typically cationic and they interact with negatively charged uh, cell membranes of bacteria uh, through electrostatic interactions mainly. Uh, 
Um, and that's why they're more selective for bacterial cell membranes all uh, over you know, typically more neutral like uh, human cell membranes. But the interesting thing about antiviral peptides, especially the ones we studied, is they they were actually neutral. They don't they don't, they don't have a cationic um, character, so they're not positively charged. Uh, the virus envelope is derived from human cell membranes or, or mammalian cell membranes, so it is also uh, more neutral-like charge. So it's not very different from bacterial cell membranes. Uh, so what we've what researchers have learned from antimicrobial peptides in the past was was you know, a foundation. Uh, but what we saw is that antiviral peptides are unlike anything we saw before. Um, and they had extremely interesting properties. And, and this was really the, the good time to combine uh, what we've uh, studied before um, or learned from the field uh, with really next generation understanding of these systems. This led us to actually really um, think about how antiviral peptides are not only interesting me mechanistically, but also how we can use them uh, for antiviral applications. Uh, and around this time, there was the Zika epidemic um, you know, occurred worldwide, especially uh, South America and, and Brazil was strongly hit. Uh, but what we saw around this time was that antiviral peptides we developed uh, were actually extremely effective at inhibiting uh, Zika virus and then other enveloped viruses. And we actually engineered an antiviral peptide uh, that could actually cross the blood-brain barrier. So not only was it a highly potent antiviral drug, um, but also it had extremely um, interesting pharmacological properties that it could cr cross the uh, BBB, blood-brain barrier. So when we administered it systemically to mice, it could actually reach the brain, uh, which for Zika virus was very important because uh, the Zika virus uh, caused viral infection in the brain and, and led to many neurodegenerative effects. Uh, so this was very important because typically uh, therapeutic antibodies and other types of antiviral drugs are very difficult to access the brain, um, especially at early stages or especially once the viral, viral load is already high. So it was really interesting because this peptide uh, could access the brain and actually uh, inhibit existing virus particles in the brain, uh, which was really important in the Zika virus context. Uh, so we actually uh, collaborated with, with great researchers at USAMRID, uh, NIAID, NIH, NIAID, Public Health England, and with, uh, with academic collaborators in Brazil um, to actually validate that this engineered antiviral peptide uh, could actually uh, inhibit viral spread in mouse model, and it, it was a very effective therapeutic um, for um, treating le uh, otherwise lethal Zika virus infection. Uh, it decreased viral loads in the blood, the brain, uh, spleen. Uh, it prevented brain damage. Uh, it reduced clinical set, uh, symptoms such as uh, high eye pressure, and it protected against the virus-induced lethality. Uh, so this was really kind of the turning point when, when we went from actually uh, looking at um, you know, antiviral peptides is interesting uh, fundamental science objects uh, to actually looking at them as potentially a uh, next generation, you know, antiviral strategies. And in the course of this research, you know, it, it would be, um, you know, it, it would it, it would be limiting to say that you know antiviral peptide research has only focused on lipid membrane uh, antiviral. It would be limiting to say that antiviral peptide research has only focused on antiviral peptides uh, because in the course of the last decade of our research, uh, there's been so many other tools we've developed to more deeply uh, study these systems and understand them. And, and we've you know, been really uh, fortunate to participate in, in building new capabilities for things such as supported lipid membrane fabrication. Um, because before uh, work done in Professor Namjoon Cho's group that I participated in, um, until recently, it was very difficult to make these lipid bilayers, uh, to make you know, virus mimicking uh, liposome platforms. Very few people could do this kind of research because it required ex very detailed uh, expertise. So one thing that we've also uh, been very active in is developing simpler ways to make support lipid bilayer membranes, uh, such as SALB, solvent-assisted lipid bilayer platform. Um, so we've also not only been focused 
on doing our own antiviral peptide research, but how, but how can we uh, develop a larger suite of biotechnology tools uh, so that other researchers can also participate in such activities? And looking at these um, systems from kind of a fundamental interfacial science perspective, uh, lipids are interesting, but we've also begun to evolve into other areas uh, like protein-based coatings and, and nanomedicine. Um, because when you think about fundamental interactions of surfaces um, in terms of absorption phenomena, conformational changes, uh, lipids are one very interesting, important system, but there, there's a lot of other systems uh, such as protein-based coatings, uh, which have been uh, very useful in our research uh, to improve kind of the immunocompatibility of nanomaterials uh, and, and also to build uh, surface passivation coatings for biosensors. So we've really uh, tried to evolve over time. Now, in terms of all those um, aspects, there's a lot of interesting scientific possibilities. And you know, I just want to emphasize uh, from an educational perspective, you know, again, to maybe younger students listening to this, um, there's so many topics that are interesting in science, and so many great reasons to you know, do a PhD and really immerse yourself. Um, one of the problems now that, you know, you, you, of course, you read about in the newspaper or watch on TV or YouTube every day uh, is, you know, viruses, uh, COVID-19, uh, other viruses. Uh, it's a global health problem. So I, I want to now switch, you know, into talking more, a little bit more specifically about our research on the antiviral peptides. Um, giving it a bit more research perspective and, and hopefully um, showing you why, you know, we, uh, my research group and collaborators and, and my advisors group and so forth, uh, why we really care about studying viruses, why, why we think antiviral peptides are such an interesting uh, strategy to stop them for the future. And I hope this talk will just show you one example of interesting research. There, there's at this conference, the AKC conference, uh, in, in, you know, your classes, uh, in, in your interactions with other experts and, and professors and students, you're going to learn about so many other types of research in your life. This is just one possibility. But I hope to show you kind of example of how we can think about viruses from engineering perspective. You know, what are their structural components, kind of conserved structural components? How can we target them? I want you to think about these kind of possibilities and then really uh, from that, how we can generate new knowledge and, and how we can build new possibilities. So, you know, when we think about back 2000, uh, this was one New York Times article that was quite popular, um, uh, one figure from the New York Times that was quite popular uh, towards the beginning of the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, and, and this was kind of an estimated range at the time of the mortality rate and percentage versus the number of uh, average number of people infected uh, per infected person. Uh, and it, it was estimated that the new, this new coronavirus at the time, COVID-19, um, had you know very serious uh, characteristics that that you know we really need to be careful. This could be a major, major uh, problem. So when we actually saw this, you know, it was very scary. I and mean, at the time, you know, people think, how can we stop it was the first question, right? But you know, from a science perspective, uh, how can we think about this in terms of stopping it, but also uh, preparing for the future? So when we see a new virus, you know, our immediate uh, impression is, you know, let's make a drug and stop it, or a vaccine to stop it. Um, and I'll focus on the therapeutic side, but you know, let, let's, let's make a drug to, you know, treat infected people, help them get healthy. And when we think about this, we need to think about kind of what is the kind of common elements of how viruses infect people uh, and, and how can we actually uh, you know, stop the virus inside infected people. Now, the traditional way is once a virus enters a human cell, uh, we stop the virus from kind of replicating its genome uh, within those infected cells. And this is called viral genome replication inhibitors. So there's many types of viral genome replication inhibitors that stop different uh, stages of the replication process. Um, but these, um, these uh, replication strategies um, can sometimes be challenging to implement from a therapeutic perspective um, because they do not stop already existing virus particles. So if there's already a lot of virus in the body, um, it, it's difficult to stop it. Uh, these work best to prevent the production of 
new virus particles, but it's difficult to stop existing virus particles. Um, in cases, there's some replication inhibitors that can work against many viruses, uh, but there's challenges too, because many of these replication inhibitors target viral proteins, uh, and these proteins can kind of mutate uh, so that they become resistant to the antiviral drug. Another interesting example is what we call entry inhibitors. These are um, antiviral drugs that actually prevent viruses from entering uh, cells in the first place, so preventing infection. Uh, so viral entry inhibitors, like, such as uh, therapeutic antibodies in some cases and other types of um, uh, biomacromolecules, are, are very interesting because they can actually stop existing virus particles and prevent them from reinfecting cells and causing more damage. But the, the challenge here is that most entry inhibitors only stop a single type of virus. And if you have a new virus, uh, you need to develop a new entry inhibitor. But this can be challenging because we need a result now. We need the entry inhibitor yesterday. We don't need it you know, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now. So entry inhibitors are a very interesting class uh, to stop existing virus particles and prevent infection. Uh, but we need to really overcome this concept of, you know, one drug, one virus. So typically these entry inhibitors, they bind to viral proteins on the surface. And as I mentioned, um, they're specific to different types of viruses. Uh, but how can we think beyond this? And, you know, and this, you know, has been covered, you know, many times um, from the perspective of, you know, a popular science perspective of how can we stop the next pandemic? You know, we definitely need to focus our current efforts on stopping COVID-19, but, but then looking forward, how can we stop the next pandemic? Uh, we have increased uh, urbanization and, and so forth, and we're going to continue having more uh, pandemics. So when we think about this next pandemic, you know, there's many different kind of possibilities. Um, many viruses we have not even really uh, deeply studied yet. You know, we, we know the kind of basic molecular properties from kind of a genomic perspective, but there, there's so many uh, viruses that have pandemic potential. And really, we, we cannot individually study each one. We cannot uh, individually study each one in, in the depth necessary uh, to, to develop you know, clinically ready antiviral drugs. And this really highlights that we need to be ready for the unknown. We can predict, we can expect, um, you know, what might be the certain properties or characteristics or, or you know, probability of a virus uh, evolving to be a you know, pandemic causing. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of what we call unknown unknowns, many you know, assumptions, uh, many um, stochastic events, essentially. I mean, we, we cannot predict, we cannot model uh, what will be the next virus it's, it's, uh, that causes a pandemic. But we have to be ready for the unknown. So what our group has done uh, in order to actually kind of think about what type of virus will, will cause the next pandemic, uh, we've actually kind of looked backwards. And by looking backwards, what I mean is we, we've actually thought about um, you know, all the virus epidemics and pandemics that have occurred over the past decade from around 2010 to 2021, and saw what are the kind of commonalities of them. So we have things like dengue, uh, MERS, yellow fever, uh, Zika, Nipah, COVID-19. And, and one thing interesting that we saw when we kind of started classifying all these different epidemics and pandemics is we saw that nearly all of them were caused by uh, viruses that had uh, membrane envelope coatings. So that, you know, there's two main types of uh, viruses, those that are non-enveloped, those that are enveloped. And we saw that almost all of them were caused by enveloped viruses. And, and this had never been uh, kind of uh, categorized before. So we were actually you know, one of the first groups to actually start thinking about um, these virus epidemics and pandemics from more of a um, structural perspective in terms of, you know, considering virus particle structure and what are kind of common targeting themes. Um, but what we saw was, you know, very surprising is that almost all the major virus epidemics and pandemics over the past decade to actually be, been caused by enveloped viruses, which, which really motivated us to think about how can we actually target this membrane envelope because it's kind of a common structural target of many different viruses. Uh, and let us think, can we develop entry inhibitors that work against many viruses uh, by targeting this membrane envelope? 
So in general, lipid membrane envelope viruses, they all have this lipid membrane coating. There's many different types, uh, important for human medicine, for uh, livestock medicine, um, but many different types of lipid membrane and uh, viruses um, that are extremely um, important to study and to stop them. So we, we have things like uh, dengue virus particles, influenza, uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, African swine fever, in, in all these cases, we actually can see that there's a lipid membrane coating around it. And this lipid membrane coating is critical for virus infection. So if we can damage this lipid membrane or stop it somehow, we can actually uh, prevent the virus infection. So there's different ways of actually targeting this viral envelope. Uh, things like antibodies can, can uh, bind to specific phospholipids uh, present on viral envelopes. Uh, this approach is interesting, but uh, a bit challenging in terms of specificity. Uh, again, uh, in B, there's other options of types of molecules that can intercalate in vir uh, viral membranes and cause uh, phospholipid oxidation, and, and this changes the membrane properties and causes um, change in membrane properties such as fluidity or rigidity, which can inhibit viral fusion. Um, and C is actually the one that we were most interested in um, because A and B have some challenging aspects in terms of specificity uh, between kind of uh, normal cells and, and cell membranes and, and virus membranes. But C is where we are very interested in and, and we're working very hard on uh, is in terms of antiviral peptides. Uh, how can we actually develop uh, antiviral peptides to inhibit viral membranes selectively uh, while not affecting uh, human cell membranes. And this is a topic that is actually quite challenging when you think about it, because the lipid composition of human cell membranes and, and viral membranes is quite similar uh, because viral membranes are derived from human cell membranes. They're, 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 they're just, uh, the lipids are you know, actually um, the same in many respects. So how do we develop something um, that's selective uh, when, when actually the two the human cell membrane and the viral membrane is composed of the same thing. What do we do? Uh, so actually to approach this problem, and you know, we've been very active in developing uh, you know, mechanistic approaches using biosensing tools and you know, to understand you know, how antiviral peptides uh, selectively uh, inhibit viral membranes uh, over human cell membranes. And a key thing for this is actually discovering that antiviral peptides uh, selectively form pores or these kind of holes in highly curved membranes, such as very small virus particles, whereas they don't, they don't form these holes in much larger cell membranes. And, and this was originally reported by uh, Professor Namjoon Cho and, and colleagues at Stanford in 2009, uh, and it's something we've continued from a mechanistic perspective to more deeply study over the past decade. Uh, but this is a very interesting aspect because most antimicrobial peptides are selected based on charge differences in membrane properties. Uh, but this is kind of the first example of a um, antiviral peptide that actually exhibits membrane curvature selectivity uh, so that it can disrupt viral membranes, but not disrupt uh, human cell membranes. And we've been able to use a more advanced nanoplasmonic techniques, such as like the LSPR and EOT techniques I showed um, briefly before, uh, in order to actually understand more mechanistically uh, how the peptide interacts with the lipid membranes with a kind of positive curvature or negative curvature. Uh, so we've really learned a lot about these systems over time, and it's been extremely rewarding uh, to actually see the combination of kind of nanotechnology and biosensors uh, being applied to understand viruses in, in such depth. Uh, we've also seen you know, many other talks at AKC um, from, from my colleagues, uh, how we can use uh, microscopy techniques uh, to actually kind of look at individual liposomes or, or virus particles at the single particle level and study the interaction uh, with uh, peptides in terms of studying dye release from the interior of these particles or in terms of uh, studying uh, membrane damage. Uh, so we've been and had extremely interesting insights um, enabled from these different types of strategies. And together, this has led us to develop you know, next generation antiviral technology um, based on these antiviral peptides. Uh, and we term this concept LEAD, uh, Lipid Envelope Antiviral Disruption. Uh, and it's been really interesting uh, to work on these kind of projects uh, in terms of you know, 
uh, the building international collaborations with experts at you know, World Health Organization, NIH, USAMRID, Public Health England, uh, and colleagues in Brazil. But, but also from fundamental engineering perspective, are really seeing that the fundamental science can lead to very innovative uh, antiviral technologies um, with the kind of right catalyst in terms of the focus, determination, and, and, and scientific leadership um, you know, from working with a great uh, collaborative team. So we've been pushing the lead concept uh, not only for Zika, uh, but also uh, for mosquito-borne viruses in general. So there's many other kind of uh, serious viruses such as dengue, yellow fever, chikungunya, West Nile. Uh, and together with uh, Professor Nam Min Cho and Professor uh, Peyong Shi, uh, we published one viewpoint article in ACS Infectious Diseases, uh, really highlighting the possibilities um, for using antiviral peptides um, to stop many different types of mosquito-borne viruses. And now we've begun to also explore this in terms of uh, COVID-19 applications with very promising preliminary results as well. Now, in terms of the actual lead concept, you know, our, one of our most exciting uh, therapeutic application examples today um, has really involved combining this viral envelope targeting with um, the blood-brain uh, barrier penetrating properties of, of selected uh, peptides, specifically the AHD peptide. Um, and, and as I mentioned in the Zika case, we saw very interesting results from kind of combining um, these concepts. Excuse me. So in the Zika case, you know, we infected mice with a lethal dose of Brazilian Zika virus. Uh, we started AH peptide treatment from day three after the infection occurred. And, and we saw some really exciting uh, clinical results, uh, clinically relevant results. Um, 10 out of 12 uh, mice treated with the AH peptide survived, whereas all the mice uh, in the no treatment group uh, died. So extremely um, high protection against uh, uh, death, virus-induced induced death, even uh, several days after the lethal virus infection was given. And the AH peptide therapy also prevented weight loss, um, prevented eye pressure increase, and, and prevented a high white blood cell count. So all very promising indications. Uh, we've also seen that these kind of technology, uh, the AHD peptide is also very useful um, to prevent kind of uh, uh, Zika virus transmission to fetuses in a Zika pregnancy model. Um, so it, it, a lot of translational potential here uh, for looking at um, exploring AHD peptide therapies uh, for preventing neurodegenerative um, disorders related to virus infection, Zika virus infection, uh, for both um, adult um, mice and also uh, fetal mice. And also, you know, this kind of demonstrates the potential of where this kind of lead technology could potentially be used uh, for human clinical applications um, once the you know, preclinical work is complete, which is ongoing. And also, you know, I want to kind of um, talk at the end of my talk a bit about uh, other applications, just to kind of show you um, broadly how can lead concept um, be extended in, in various directions. So in, in Singapore, I really had a wonderful experience uh, learning about antiviral peptides uh, for studying, you know, uh, studying human medical problems and, and developing solutions for human medicine. Um, but I think that the basic principles of kind of engineering uh, lipid membrane uh, fundamentals, uh, antimicrobial strategies can, can also be ex uh, explored in very diverse ways that one might never expect upon first glance. And, and one example of this uh, was recently covered in the Financial Times, um, and, and it's been a major issue for agriculture field in general. Uh, if you're interested, you can watch the video at this link. Uh, but, but you know, the, the issue of African swine fever, it's an envelope virus affecting pig populations worldwide. Um, this has created a real crisis as well. And it's another interesting example how lead related concepts can be applied to the agricultural sector um, as well. So uh, around 2018, there was a major outbreak of African swine fever among pig populations in, in Asia, and, and there's also been other outbreaks uh, worldwide. Uh, this virus is very scary um, because it has a nearly 100% mortality rate among infected pigs, uh, and, and if it, pigs that a farmer infected with this, 
they essentially typically need to kill all the pigs on the farm uh, kind of preventively uh, to prevent spread of ASF. Uh, and it has had a huge impact on the, the pork uh, market worldwide over the past few years um, and led to extensive um, agricultural product, livestock production challenges. And a, a large fraction of pigs in, in China have had to have been killed due to this ASF uh, epidemic problem. Well, what researchers at Kansas State and other uh, academic and research organizations worldwide discovered is that actually the pig food uh, feed is, is a key transmission vector uh, for ASF virus. And, and this led researchers to actually um, begin to think about how can we actually stop ASF transmission and feed in order to hopefully stop the epidemic and, and prevent future outbreaks. So this was um, you know, first kind of validated in an article and by Kansas State and, and colleagues um, kind of showing that you know, infectious dose of African swine fever virus um, you know, can occur when, when consumed in liquid or feed. And it really showed that in feed, um, you know, it's a very important vector and, and we need to stop it. Now, one way to actually stop uh, virus transmission in animal feed is to use chemical uh, additives uh, so, so feed supplements uh, to actually reduce the amount of virus in feed. And, and typically we think about this in terms of the concept of chemical mitigation. So one compound that's often uh, has been used in the past uh, for, for actually inactivating viruses and, and bacteria in feed is called formaldehyde, uh, which is uh, has been widely used and in some countries still used, but in, in other places such as the EU, European Union, uh, formaldehyde has been banned uh, because it can have negative health effects, including carcinogenic risk. Um, so, so there's really a look towards, you know, how can we develop kind of uh, feed additives um, for chemical mitigation of viruses in feed um, that are based on kind of safe, uh, and, safe and natural compounds. So what my research group has done together with collaborators in the United States is actually begin exploring uh, how we can utilize medium chain fatty acids and monoglycerides um, as feed additives uh, for chemical mitigation. Um, really looking at medium chain fatty acids and monoglycerides as one potential uh, replacement uh, for uh, formaldehyde uh, and kind of a natural solution for chemical mitigation. And we saw that there's many different interesting fatty acids and monoglycerides um, that have suitable properties, especially uh, fatty acids with kind of C6 to C12 um, carbon chains. So 6 to 12 carbon long chains, uh, caproic acid, caprylic acid, capric acid, lauric acid, and also the corresponding uh, monoglyceride derivatives, uh, glycerol monocaproate, glycerol monocaprylate, uh, oh, I mean, say that 10 times fast, uh, glycerol monocaproate, uh, glycerol monocaprylate, uh, glycerol monocaprate and glycerol monolaurate. Uh, so these compounds have extremely interesting properties. Uh, we've studied them from a biophysical perspective, but also um, start understanding them in terms of actually antiviral effects uh, and, and suitable ASF models. And this led us uh, to publish a newspaper article last year in, in one of the trade industry journals called Feedstuffs, um, ask, asking the question, uh, are fatty acids and monoglycerides virus killing feed additives? And um, in past work over the past maybe five, six years um, in our research group and in, in, in previous work and in, in together with Professor Nam Min Cho, uh, we've really studied the fundamental uh, interactions of fatty acids and monoglycerides uh, with lipid bilayer platforms. And this kind of fundamental characterization really positioned us uh, to have a deep mechanic, uh, mechanistic understanding of how different fatty acids and monoglycerides and mixtures uh, work and how we can actually define potency and mechanism of action for practical use. So before our studies, there's been some previous work um, in the field looking a bit empirically at kind of antibacterial activity and antiviral activity of selected uh, fatty acids, monoglycerides against pathogens. Um, but what we really try to do for the first time is demonstrate uh, that these monoglycerides and fatty acids uh, can actually be very effective for stopping ASF uh, in liquid and feed environments. So initially we looked at how 
these fatty acids and, and monoglycerides, especially glycerol monolaurate, GML, can stop uh, ASF in liquid. And we saw that fatty acids and monoglycerides were effective in decreasing ASF in liquid, especially GML and capric acid were very effective. And, and GML was also effective at lower concentrations. So it was uh, had about an almost two log drop in the amount of infectious virus and was also infectious at low concentrations, which, which means it's highly potent. Uh, when we tested um, the effects of uh, GML and a mixture of fatty acids in, in feed, where we had kind of virus contaminated feed, uh, we saw that GML, uh, some kind of model monoglyceride, can also reduce AFS, ASF in animal feed, uh, which makes it really promising uh, for agricultural applications. And just to highlight how interdisciplinary this kind of research can be, uh, we've also kind of expanded this work, not only from kind of a kind of agricultural biology perspective, but also kind of looking at the biophysics and, and mathematical modeling of ASF mitigation and feed um, to really understand what is happening in terms of the physics, the, the biophysics, and, and how can we develop uh, better uh, mitigation strategies. So I think this is a topic that really combines you know, fundamental science uh, with practical application. And, and one of the interesting things about agricultural uh, application is that if we use regulatory acceptable um, materials, there's very um, excellent potential to translate um, our studies into meaningful uh, you know, products and technologies that can directly serve market needs. Uh, so it's really quite interesting uh, to directly see a problem and propose a solution you know, on a relatively short uh, time scale. And we're trying to build this up, you know, like how I showed you for antiviral peptides and, and for what I did you know, in my PhD education in, in Singapore and in my journey to an overseas professorship, uh, we're now trying to build similar innovation concepts uh, for uh, agricultural applications, you know, call it from the lab to the farm, um, really looking at how engineering technology combined with microbiology testing uh, can lead to uh, new solutions that drive improved application performance uh, in, in, uh, in agricultural settings. So I think you know, one other thing here, whether it's human medicine, uh, whether it's agriculture, um, the basic concepts are quite similar, even, even though they look different, you may see a pig or you know, a human or you know, a peptide or a lipid, um, the, the basic concepts, the philosophy is quite similar. Um, you know, this innovation from fundamental engineering approaches uh, to applying them to kind of uh, medical and biotechnology applications, um, there's, there's broader trends here. And so what I've presented today on you know, antiviral peptides for human medicine, um, briefly introduced antimicrobial lipids for agricultural applications. Um, this is just tip of the iceberg. You know, there's a million different applications we could imagine for the future, and it's it's you know wide open. So for people who are interested, young students or anyone who's interested in in learning about these kind of technologies and kind of um, you know seeing the future potential, I mean, I highly encourage you to become involved in this research, whether it's in my lab here at SKQ or, or at NTU or in another lab. Um, there's so many possibilities, and, and we simply need um, you know dedicated people uh, to really you know passionate people uh, to, to become part of our teams and to keep growing them and to, to really um, you know, to build the next frontiers of science. So I just wanna go back to the you know, previous um, slide I had shown you about the kind of my career advice and really emphasize you know, the, the aspects of networking, loyalty, focus, determination. Um, you know, none of us are perfect. We're having up, ups and downs on, on a daily basis. Um, but if you keep these kind of points in mind, I, I think overall um, you have a very fruitful scientific career and really, you know, remember that, you know, science is not a one day journey. Um, some days the, the experiment just doesn't work for whatever reason, um, or, you know, your paper gets rejected for whatever reason. Uh, you, you can't control these things. Uh, but what you can control is your committed effort, uh, diligence, and, and really remember that, you know, tomorrow is a new day with new possibilities and kind of keep working hard, um, stay positive, and, and good things will happen over time. And I'd like to you know, thank you uh, for listening uh, to this talk. It's been my great pleasure to um, discuss these aspects today. 
um, I put my email address on the front page and we'll, we'll be glad to uh, you know, um, communicate with you further um, by email or and so forth uh, anytime if you have any questions. And I'd like to just um, thank the collaborators involved in the work today. Um, Professor Paul Weiss at UCLA, um, Professor Char Charles Elrod at Cornell University, Professor Cassandra Jones at Kansas State, uh, Professor Dean Boyd at North Carolina State, Professor Vivian Costa, the Federal University of Minas Gerais in, uh, in Brazil, uh, Professor Sean Yano at University of Minnesota, Professor Vladimir Zdanov at uh, Russian Academy of Sciences. And I, I you know, I everyone you know, has been great, wonderful collaborator, and I look forward to more collaborations with the people listed here and with many other people in the future. Uh, but I would also like to you know, give special thanks uh, for my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Namjoon Cho of NTU, uh, who you know, invited me to give this talk and also uh, you know, has played a critical role in mentoring me for the past uh, 12, 12 plus years. Um, so you know, this work could not have been uh, accomplished without his uh, mentorship and, and inspiration, and I'm very thankful uh, to work with him. Uh, I'm also very thankful to work with uh, Professor Jeffrey Glenn at Stanford University, uh, who is my uh, postdoc advisor, and I think there's a lot of great uh, collaboration possibilities uh, to keep working together for the future, uh, as well as you know, Professor Curtis Frank uh, at Stanford University, uh, who really gave me the first opportunities there, and, and I will be you know, extremely grateful forever. Um, so there, there's been many people. Um, I tried my best to mention as many people as possible who have helped me in my scientific career. Uh, but this is just tip of the iceberg. Um, there's so many people that have influenced me and guided me and supported me and helped me uh, in, in many different ways. And I, I, I want to thank each and every one of them. And, and remember, you know, today's talk is not just for the you know, research, but I also tried to tailor it uh, for the education and, and kind of, you know, advice perspectives. Um, so, you know, for younger students listening to this, I hope you can, you know, take away, you know, one or two interesting points from today. If you just take away one interesting point today, I'll, I'll be happy and, and feel that, you know, the talk was worth listening to. Um, but thank you very much for the time, uh, giving me the time to speak today uh, at this important event. Um, if you have any questions or you would like to discuss further any of the points uh, here or anything else, uh, please feel free to contact me anytime. And thank you very much.